If the doomsday clock that counts down the remaining time on Earth as we know it is nearing the midnight hour, what are the signs that believers can point to to share a warning with others? What role does Israel play in the events as foretold in the book of Revelation? And how will the new Jerusalem be radically different than you've heard it spoken of in church? Our guests are here today, right now, to discuss all of this. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Skywatch TV. I'm Joe Artis Horn. Today, we have an incredible panel lined up for you. Let me introduce first who's here, and then we'll get into today's discussion. He's a Bible teacher with a Master of Divinity degree from Talbot University, retired financial business analyst, and valuable voice in biblical prophecy, Jonathan Brentner. This next gentleman almost doesn't need an introduction, but he's the author of countless best-selling books that have been distributed into the hundreds of thousands of copies worldwide, and he's a dear friend of not only our ministry, but my family as well, Mr. Terry James. She's a credentialed, ordained reverend with a degree in Bible and theology, a powerful voice in Christian television, Donna Howell. His broadcasting career has spanned for more than 40 years. He's the best-selling author of the groundbreaking books Last Clash of the Titans, The Great Inception, and The Second Coming of Saturn, Derek Gilbert. She's a legend and pioneer of podcast radio, Christian television personality, and best-selling <laughs> author of the Red Wing Saga, Sharon Gilbert. How many of you have enjoyed the adventure that we've been on for the last couple of weeks? For those just joining us, we have been in a bit of a deep dive on two new works from Defender Publishing. First, Terry James, Nearing Midnight, as it was in the days of Lot. And Terry James and Jonathan C. Brentner, Hereafter, it's far better than you can imagine. And I think these guys have done a fabulous job over the last couple of weeks articulating some of what that hereafter might look like and how it differs from what those of us maybe who have seen movies or television programs trying to depict the next life for those believers that are with Christ now, we've ascended. And it's not really the picture that we're told it is, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Terry, I want to shift back to your book for a minute, Nearing Midnight. And again, if you've missed the last couple of weeks of discussion, go back to the archives. Watch them wherever you watch Skywatch Television, including the Skywatch Television mobile app. Because what Terry and Jonathan have masterfully executed is basically a clinic on what I think the prophetic times that we're headed towards right now really look like. And even without setting dates, how soon some of these revelation events will begin. Uh, Terry, in your book, Nearing Midnight, you say that there is an effort to build back Babel. That's quite an assertion. Can you explain mm -hmm. that? Well, uh, I, equated, I equated somewhat to the phrase, political phrase, build back better, mm -hmm. and sure. also the Great Reset. God had to destroy uh, the Antediluvian world with the flood who were trying basically to get away totally from God's order of things. And uh, so God had to reach down and he had to take a few people out in the ark. And uh, then after they came out and settled, well, civilization began again. And uh, they scattered to the plains of Shinar and other places. Well, humanity being having the fallen mind since the Garden of Eden when Satan tempted Eve and then Adam fell, then uh, have the mindset they want to get away from God's order of things. And so they start again on the plains of Shinar to build a <clears throat> tower of the area of Babel on the plains of Shinar that would reach to, unto heaven. And in other words, usurp the throne of God. The same thing that uh, God's Word said that Lucifer wanted to do in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14. So again, man reached for the destruction of God's order and uh, the institution of their own. Well, God had to again reach down, confuse their language, tear down the, the tower and scatter them all across the then known world. And uh, so from, from that Tower of Babel experience, where well, we've seen the whole thing start to come together again. 
And it's been coming along for a long time since the Tower of Babel. But uh, mankind, again, is uh, trying to regroup, trying to uh, change God's order of things. And we saw it first with probably the League of Nations around you know, the time of World War I. Woodrow Wilson and all that, they tried with the League of Nations. Well, that failed. But following World War II, World War II was so totally destructive, the greatest war of carnage of all times, ending with nuclear devastation of, of Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. They had to come together and do something to prove that they could control things, so they developed the United Nations. So the United Nations is, is um, probably at the core of things, and since then we've had the World Economic Forum and a lot of other what I call Ephesians 6, 12, principalities and powers coming together and try to usurp the throne of God. We see it every day through gender dysphoria and different things, try to change even the basic genetics of God's creation called man. And so many other ways we see them trying to usurp God's order. They're trying to build back uh, Babel, <laughs> build back better, but it's going to fail miserably, of course. And uh, again, Christ is going to have to return and, and make all things right. Well, there's nothing better about what they're doing. They're not building back better at all. They're building back worse. And they're taking the money and telling us this is for your own good. Mm -hmm. It's a paternalistic, right. demonic construct. Great minds must think alike because I actually did a, a conference presentation titled Build Back Babel. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, it, it just, it seemed like an obvious thing. Obviously, if I think about it, somebody smarter like Terry James is going to come across Very it good, too. Yes. I absolutely agree. And, and I think what was, what was at work here, I mean, it had to be something really serious for God to come down personally and intervene. That doesn't happen very often in scripture. So I think when Babel is taught in churches, it is often given as an example of pride that somehow they thought they could build a tower. They could. I'm pretty sure that 5,000 years ago, structural engineers were aware they couldn't stack mud brick high enough to actually literally reach the heavens. I think they were trying to do something spiritual. They were trying to reconnect with the mm. old gods who had been punished through the flood of Noah That's and it. had been right. sent down as... Peter and Jude both say, mm -hmm. you know, as 2 Peter 2, verse 4, God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them down to, it's not Hades in the Greek, it's Tartarosis, Tartarus, mm -hmm. the bottomless pit, the abyss. This, I think, was what was going on at Babel, because in the original, as you know, Terry, it means God gate or gate of gods. Mm -hmm. They were trying to open a portal, and mm -hmm. the Lord God Almighty okay. said, no, no, we're, we're yeah, not yeah. doing that. Mm -hmm. And you can almost yeah. sense the portals being opened, can't you, a little bit of time? Yeah. The portals well, are yeah. another dimension. We're, we're aware of some, uh, a friend of ours who's a researcher into <clears throat> occult crime mm -hmm. has told us quietly that, that friends that he has who are embedded inside certain occult movements report, and this is several years ago now, that uh, something happened within the last 10 years and oh, something wow. very dark and evil is coming I through agree. gates that have been opened that these occultists don't know how to close. Mm -hmm. I am on the fence regarding physical portals, like specific mm -hmm. geographic locations, mm -hmm. you know, that's a portal, that's a portal. I think the portal that we need to be concerned with is in the human heart. Amen. If you oh, give yeah. permission to the entity to enter you, the mm -hmm. demon or the, wow. the entity that's whispering to you, and I think what's happening is more activity because more people are opening themselves up to that influence. Mm -hmm. Yes, free will is the one thing that the enemy wants to take away from us. He will use our weaknesses to lure us into sin, to lure us into being part of this new Babel civilization. But once we enter that, the free will is gone. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Terry, in the last section of Nearing Midnight, you have, because we're talking about, you know, the Great Reset, you've actually got some interesting chapters that have titles that I found very fascinating, like Raging Towards Reset. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's one of them. How about this? Business as usual. Mm -hmm. Well, what are the main thrusts of these parts of the book? Why did you include them, and how do they relate to the prophetic implications that we're living out right now? Well, because as I think it just it shows the rapidity with which we're moving toward uh, uh, the total time of midnight, and but at the, at the, at the last part of the book I wanted to, to point out that it's business as usual. To me, that, that smacks of Christ's, uh, Christ's words in Luke 17, verses 28 through 30, basically about days of Lot, which is a subtitle of the book. I wanted to point to the fact that, that there's a glorious time coming when all of this is going to be brought to an end. We're seeing a time as it was uh, in the days of Lot. I think we have reached that point. And uh, and that means, to my way of thinking, if we, if we believe Christ's words, and who else 
could we use as a prophet to be more forthtelling than Jesus? He says it's going to be just like that when he returns to take believers out as he did a lot in his daughters uh, to safety. So I think we're right at that point because we are certainly, at least in, in this nation alone, I think it's more manifest that uh, we have reached a time of like it was in the days of Sodom where business right. as usual on the surface and such evil wickedness right. just underneath. In the first episode, you made reference to the city of Sodom and, and uh, some research, and uh, you gave me undeserved credit. I want to I point to the researchers for whom credit is really deserved. Dr. Stephen Collins at Trinity Southwest University, yeah. his director of scientific analysis, Dr. Philip Sylvia, uh, Dr. Gary Byers, who works with the two of them, and they've been digging at the site of Sodom, yeah. a place in Jordan called Tal El Hammam, for the last 16, 17 years. Mm. But just to give an idea of what is uh, the contrast between what you and Jonathan Brenton write about in hereafter and the destruction that came so suddenly upon Sodom. What they found at this location just across the river from Jericho, you can see it uh, about six miles northwest of Mount Nebo, is a city that at the time was about eight to ten times larger than either Jericho or Jerusalem. It was the largest, most wealthy city in the southern Levant at the time. It was south of Hatzor, which is north of the Sea of Galilee. It was, the, it was the biggest city. It was never militarily conquered. According to the digs that they've done there over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. it was continuously occupied from roughly 4500 BC until its destruction around 1700 BC. 2,800 years. That's the distance of time between the prophet Elisha and us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? Wow. That's how long that city was occupied without ever being militarily mm -hmm. conquered. Mm -hmm. And it was destroyed in the blink of an eye by an explosion mm -hmm. that was so intense. They asked, you mentioned, like in the first episode, charred bits of pottery. Mm -hmm. They found those little bits of pottery, five millimeters thick. The top millimeter glazed, and bear in mind, glazing pottery was not a thing for another thousand right. years, yeah, okay? Yeah. The next two were charred, next two millimeters charred, the bottom two millimeters untouched. Something extremely hot, extremely brief, like an explosion over the north end of the Dead Sea, destroyed that city. They estimate the speed of the wind at about 725 miles an hour. That's about three and a half times more powerful than the most powerful yeah. F5 tornado. And when not when is this most recent uh, evidence that absolutely existed? When is, how long ago was that? That's pretty recent, isn't this, it? This was only published in the fall of 2021 yeah, I thought so, in a, a peer-reviewed journal. And, of course, it kicked up a firestorm oh, of protest yeah. because skeptics want to say, well, they're just yeah. trying to prove the Bible. But then there are you know, others who say, well, it doesn't fit the timeline because Abraham didn't live then. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. But here's a city that was in the right place, visible from Bethel when Abraham and Lot separated their ways. It was the well-watered plain at the southern, the Kikar, the, the disc, the southern end of the Jordan and Valley. it's covered in salt. And it is covered in salt. When they did soil samples... Of the, of the valley, and they found salt leaching to the surface in the destruction layer, mm -hmm. eight miles from the Dead Sea, and they wow. tested it chemically. They found the sulfates and chemical composition of the salts they found matched exactly the Dead Sea eight miles away. So now we have a scientific explanation for Lot's wife. Mm -hmm. She got hit with superheated brine yeah, yeah. and literally turned into a pillar of salt. But the destruction, the absolute destruction, they found some human remains there, and in a nice way of saying it, they, they report they were all disarticulated which means they were literally blown apart. apart. That is the type of destruction that Jesus is talking about coming mm -hmm. as it was in the days of Lot, so it will be at the coming of the wow. Son of it Man. It was the most beautiful area. Lot wanted to, wanted to take that, that yes. place when, when Abraham offered. Fed Albert, by a know. beautiful spring. It yeah. was, it was and, um, gorgeous. That's kind of America in, in microcosm, kind in of. my opinion. Absolutely. So yes, your subtitle I think is fascinating for that reason because thanks to Dr. Collins and his research yeah. there, we have learned a lot about how intense that destruction was. Mm -hmm. And for Jesus to link his return to that event, I mean, that should be that's, an eye-opener. Mm -hmm. I think that's the number one prophecy for our time, for, our mo for this moment. And we're living in the first generation to have access to this research to show, hey, look, mm -hmm. this biblical event, not only real, but this points to what is yet to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe that. And it, it also seems to coalesce with something that my father and I used to talk about when you're talking about the way that we are politically, the way that we are spiritually the prophetic timeline, when you look out your back door and you see what's going on in the world. Mm. And I recall just a few years ago, if I may share this, I said to my father, I was starting to despair about the state of Christianity because I was looking at the conventional, you know, four walls with a white steeple, what was happening in popular church culture. And I said, Dad, 
I feel like selling the gospel is becoming impossible because we're dealing with a reprobate generation that doesn't believe that they need a Messiah. Mm. They have everything they want. They mm -hmm. don't know how we got here. They, 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 we're not dealing with a great generation of soldiers now that right. there are great grandfathers right. who understand politically and socioeconomically why we exist and what the U.S. is. This new generation of video game playing, fast food eating, <laughs> and a lot of, you know, v view them as victims, really. But I said... Uh, probably six years ago, I said, they don't believe they need a Messiah. And that's always going to tinker with the fact that we're wired to be submissive to one, which leads to this opening of darkness and this coalescence of opening of portals and kids becoming fascinated with the supernatural and everything else because they're looking for that thing that nobody's told them about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said to my dad, I said, I feel like it's impossible, you know, it's getting difficult to sell the gospel. It's this tired old book. To these kids, it's this tired right. old book with a Messiah figure that was old and he had a long beard. I don't know. And my dad stopped me. He said, no, 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 not even for a minute. You are missing the elephant in the room. And I said, what? And he goes, this reprobate generation that you're talking about is literally in all of their actions screaming for the one thing that will always be fleeting, and that's for happiness. And the only way to find that is to mm. find Jesus. Yeah. So actually, if you flip the script, this is probably one of the most profound times to be preaching the gospel because there's a generation of kids out there that don't know of its existence, mm -hmm. and yet they're completely on whole. Mm -hmm. so, that's right. So this whole demonic descent, and now we get back to what you're asserting in books like Nearing Midnight, you actually have a chapter called Demonic Descent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what is wrapped up within that ominous sounding title and what does it have to do with the buildup toward the times wherein we will see the rapture take place? Because this is something, if we, could, if we could exercise this 60 seconds for social media and get every teenager mm -hmm. on the planet to see it, it could be profound. Amen. Yes. Well, it's like Eric was alluding to, I, I think it's, it comes from the, the, the spirit of man, the fallen mind of man is dimensional, but it, it's a spiritual portal that are being opened, I think. And um, so that's what I mean really by demonic descent. We've seen it, we're seeing it develop day by day. And we see it, of course, reported manifest in the news. And again, I think one of the key things is the addictions that Satan has been able to put forward on, on the youth, particularly of America and then of the world. I mean, you know, you can't go anywhere without somebody having their head in, the, in their smartphones and so mm -hmm. forth. I can see Tom Horn's... Um, saying that kids are looking, people are looking for it. But the key is to trigger that desire to see who the, what the truth of all of this is. And it's mm -hmm. hard to do with this, all of this electronic bondage that they're in. It is. That's about the best I can say. Oh, yeah. We need a great awakening. So that's the reset we need, right? Amen. Yes, there it is. <laughs> Amen. There it is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we want to make sure you know how you can get your copies of both of these new fascinating works in the Nearing Midnight and Hereafter exclusive offer. This amazing offer includes Nearing Midnight as it was in the days of Lot by the legendary Terry James that explores in detail through the prism of God's word the potential for nuclear war to break out at any moment. How the entire world is facing the eminency of a dictatorial digital monetary system. Why Mother Earth worship in the form of climate change insanity is being forced upon humanity. How the entities of Ephesians 6.12 will establish control through a new world order and the blessed hope believers have in the return of the Messiah. Also included in this special offer is Jonathan Brentner's Hereafter. It's far better than you can imagine. This beautifully written new masterpiece will forever change the way that you view the afterlife. You will experience the anticipation of the jubilant reunion and celebrations in heaven that believers will partake in after this current life. Broaden your understanding of heaven and the start of eternity. You'll also learn the answers to difficult questions like, how will we experience and perceive time once in heaven? What will our emotions be like? What will our heavenly bodies be like? Will we have supernatural powers? And so much more. But we're just getting started. Also included is Jonathan Brentner's best-selling book, Triumph of the Redeemed. In this fascinating work, Jonathan helps you grasp on to the eternal perspective during life's perilous circumstances, the new earth, and so much more. 
This incredible offer also includes The Coming Judgments on DVD, where Terry James and Pete Garcia delve into great detail on the seal, trumpets, and bowl judgments listed in the book of Revelation. Also included is Jonathan Brentner's presentation entitled Hope in the Rapture. You'll be shocked when you find out why the Thessalonians were grief-stricken regarding the rapture upon receiving the Apostle Paul's first letter and how you can be free from this very same trap. Sold separately, these items hold a retail value of nearly $90. Yours now for your donation of only $45, which includes includes free shipping to all U.S. orders. So don't delay. You can scan the QR code on your screen right now using the camera app on your phone for instant access to this exclusive offer. You can also visit us at skywatchtvstore.com or call 1-844-750-4985 and ask for the nearing midnight and hereafter exclusive offer right now. Wow. It's not an opportunity that you're going to want to miss, I promise you. With just a few minutes left on the clock, let's pivot back to you, Jonathan. Okay. You know, many who follow Bible prophecy, or politics for that matter, they have, especially right now, with everything that's going on in Israel, mm -hmm. they have their eyes on Israel. Now, can you tell us why that is and why it's so important for us to understand God's promise to Israel? Okay, well, there's several things I could say, but primarily... Um, and we know that the Lord has promised Israel a kingdom, and it matters, and we're going to inherit a kingdom too. How they mesh tells us a lot about what our eternity will be like, especially our, our millennial reign right. with Jesus, because we'll be reigning with him, and Israel will be there. The Lord Jesus will be the king of Israel, plus he'll be the king of the whole world. And so it, it matters about this kingdom that we're going to inherit. And it also matters about the fact that God does keep his promises. The Lord is going to keep his promises to Israel. He's going to keep his promises to us. He is a God who keeps his word and does not renege on his That's word. Right. And I Amen. think that is so critical to understand as well. Amen. While you're talking about the topic of Israel, Jerusalem carries through to the very end of prophecy in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. And even after the earth as we know it is gone, Jerusalem is being rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And it's the new realm of God's kingdom. You mentioned something interesting that seems to tie visions described in Ezekiel to these events. Now tell us, what are the similarities between Ezekiel's description of the mountaintop temple from which Jesus will reign and John's portrayal of the New Testament. Yeah, this is actually something that that was really eye-opening to me as I was studying and preparing to write about the book because I wanted to, to bring in Ezekiel's vision of the millennial temple. As I looked at the chapters of Ezekiel, primarily 40 to 44, I began to see similarities with what John records in the book of Revelation about the new Jerusalem in the eternal state, the new Jerusalem that comes down, the new earth and the new heavens, everything is combined. And first of all, I noticed that in the Ezekiel vision that there's, um, there is an angel measuring it. You know, there, you know, you have someone measuring the temple in the millennium in Ezekiel's version. And of course, when you get to the last chapters of Revelation, some an angel's measuring it for John. That's like we know it's approximately 1,500 miles. And then also, there's the idea that there's going to be a stream of living water flowing from from the new Jerusalem and the eternal state, and also from this temple, you know, in, in this, this mountaintop temple in, that Ezekiel describes. And, and also there's the idea that it's going to portray the glory of God. Jesus' glory is going to shine forth from this, this mountaintop temple and, and palace that the Lord Jesus is going to have. And it's also going to happen in the New Jerusalem where there's going to be no need for the sun or the moon because the light from the New Jerusalem is going to diffuse itself through the entire world. And there's also the interesting thing about the verification of the vision. You know, in this book of Ezekiel, it talks about the fact that, that someone verifies, yes, the words that, that were spoken to Ezekiel are true. Of Revelation 22, you have the same thing where the Lord is verifying John's 
John's vision. He's saying, yes, these words are true. And so I have those, you know, I was really struck by those four similarities. But there is a key difference, however, and I think it shows that, that what you read in Ezekiel is not the New Jerusalem because at Ezekiel, it's all about a temple, this glorious temple. And I believe it'll be a dwelling place of the Lord. And the book of Psalms refers to King seeing it and fleeing because it's so wonderful and glorious. But you get to the book of Revelation, he says, there's no temple in the New Jerusalem. Now, I can't explain why the Lord is going to have a a new millennial temple during his reign, you know, I don't know why, but it's what God's word says. But those things just really struck me as as I was researching it and writing. I go, wow, look at this. You know, I'd never noticed that before until I was writing that chapter for this book. One of the things I find interesting about Ezekiel's prophecy, that temple, is that was one of the key things that led the Essenes to split from the religious establishment in Jerusalem because they foresaw an establishment of a new heavenly temple, basically a return to the law instead of just the dry uh, rote repetition of the ritual huh. because you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees who, who believed that, uh, you know, no, we've, we've got this. There is no new revelation coming. There is no need for a Messiah or anything like that. There is no anointed one, chosen one. There is no son of man coming. Just let us continue doing our rituals and everything will be fine. And the Essenes, <laughs> mm-hmm. they had a different vision. And it's interesting that uh, the Essenes, who were the authors of the book of First Enoch, used a phrase that Jesus applied to himself about 80 times in the New Testament, the Son of Man. Yeah, it's interesting what you say about the, the Sadducees, because it sounds like a lot of what we hear in our churches today, <laughs> that it's, you know, it's the, your best life now, even though these, these same pastors would condemn Joel Osteen's book, but yet the message they proclaim is very similar to mm-hmm. your best life now. Yes. You know, Prosperity. forget about eternal life, mm-hmm. just focus on being the best possible Christian. There's nothing wrong with that, obviously. But if that's your only focus, I mean, bad things happen in this life, and that's why we need to uh, focus on eternity, you know, when we all get old, and hopefully we won't die because the rapture will happen, but it could happen, Mm -hmm. it could happen that we will die, you know, what what happens that to this life? That's right, Right. that's right. The fundamental difference, the the Essenes were looking for a divine great reset with the coming of the anointed one, Mm -hmm. Uh whereas the uh, religious establishment was trying to create their own, and I think that's the same same thing today. Same Same thing that we see today, today. yes. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not the era to live without salvation. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, he's very easy to access. You just ask him to come into your heart Mm -hmm. and be the Lord and Savior of your life, and you will be saved. He promises you this. Unfortunately, we're all out of time for this week, but join us next week when our guests return to talk about what Christ's 1,000-year reign will look like Mm. and whether or not heaven will look like it's portrayed in pop culture media, (laughs) TV shows, and movies. The answer to that question may actually shock you. That's all coming next week for everybody here on panel. Jonathan Brentner, Terry James, Donna Howell, Derek, and Sharon Gilbert. I'm Joe Artis Horn. Keep your eyes on the prize, which is Jesus Christ. We'll be back. 